In this video, we're going to wrap up our section on mechanical gear analysis and design with the topics of gear trains, planetary gear sets, and differentials. Today's agenda will start off with a focus on gear trains, and then we're going to move on to multi-degree of freedom gear sets. And the two types we're going to focus on include planetary gear sets, which we've already talked a little bit about previously, as well as differentials. Finally, we're going to go through a brief description of hel helical gear force analysis, which is something that's important not just for the current homework set, but understanding this mode of uh, thrust force generation is something that's important for later elements in class. Let's talk about series gear sets and gear trains first. Here we have a simple image of three spur gears in series. Why might we need a series gear set? What are the functional purposes of having a series gear set? One is to reverse rotational direction. For example, we've talked about manual transmissions, automotive manual, manual transmissions previously in class, and we've discussed how do we actually reverse direction when we put the transmission into reverse. And the answer is we have this reversed I, reverse idler gear that slides in between these gears on the output shaft and the counter shaft. And because we have this additional gear in between, it doesn't change the speed ratio between the, the bottom gear here and the top gear, but it changes the direction. So that's one important reason we might want to have a, a series gear set. Another might be to provide multiple output speeds from the same input rotational power source. So, for example, what if this middle gear, what if this provides the input, and then we have two different outputs over here, output uh, one on the left and output two on the right. We have these idler gears in between. And we'll see also as we go through the analysis for series like this, a series gear sets that it's really just the ratio between the, the input gear and the final output gear that determines the speed ratio. The idler gears or any of the other gears in between, those don't influence the output ratio. So based on that, can you determine what are both of the output speeds and directions of rotation? That's a conceptual check to, to make sure that the concept of series gear trains make sense right now. Another possible reason to have a series gear set is to produce higher speed reductions. We're going to go through two example gear trains, and one of them is a, a simple series gear train where it does not really provide much speed reduction advantage, but the other one is a compound gear train and that does help to increase the possible speed reduction compared to a simple series gear train. So here's a an image of a compound gear train figure from the textbook. So when I say compound that refers specifically to this configuration right here where we have gears 4 and 5 rotating together on the same shaft but they are different sizes, different diameters, different numbers of teeth and so Say if uh, this N3, if that's the input, then it is driving gear 4, but then gear 4 is directly connected to gear 5, so they're rotating at the same speed, and then gear 5 is meshed with gear 6. And so this allows us to change the overall speed ratio more significantly than we could if we just had a simple gear train, a simple series gear train. One important calculation is called the train value, and that's E here. We have the speed of the last gear is equal to E times the speed of the first gear, and the way we calculate that is just the product of the gear teeth of the driving gears divided by the product of the gear teeth of the driven gears. And so in doing that, these different uh, gears can either be a drive gear or a driven gear. So for example, N3 right here, when we're looking at if N2 is the input, N2 is the drive gear, and N3 is the driven gear. But then if we look at N3 and N4, they're meshed, then 
and gear three becomes the drive gear and then gear four becomes the driven gear. So more precisely, we could calculate the speed of the last gear, omega six, as the product of all of the driving gears divided by all of the driven gears. And some of these cancel out. So we looked at gear three, for example, and this serves both as a drive gear and as a driven gear, so that cancels out. But then four and five are distinct, and so they show up after we've made all simplifications. And so the train value here is n2 times n5 over n4 times n6. If we were to have a simple series gear train, if instead of having gear four and gear five being different size teeth, if it was the same number of teeth, if n4 equals n5, then those would cancel out. And then again, we would have just n2 over n6. So that's another demonstration of how in a simple series gear train, it really only matters what the size of the first gear is and the last gear is. What's stopping us from using a single pair of gears to achieve a large speed reduction? Think back to the last lecture. What were some of the practical constraints we discussed on actual mechanical gear sets? Some of the big issues include interference, so non-involute contact. If we have a base circle uh, that extends above the dedendum and the meshing gear actually contacts the uh, opposing gear below the base circle, then that is non-involute contact, and that causes a, a range of different problems that we discussed in the last video. Contact ratio, we need, to, we, we need to make sure we have sufficient contact ratio. And then of course strength constraints, this is something that's covered in chapter 14 that we're not covering in this class, but all of these impose a lower bound on how we can make, how small we can make a gear set, and also they place important bounds on what is the maximum ratio between uh, diameters. And, and so it's helpful sometimes to have a compound gear set so that we can achieve these higher speed reductions or speed increases that we can't in practice achieve using a single pair of gears. And compound gear sets like this, this is just one way to achieve these higher speed reductions. There are others. We have talked some about planetary gear sets, for example, and a series of planetary gear sets can be capable of very large speed reductions in a, a very compact space. So that's another thing to be aware of if your objective is to have a large speed reduction in a physically compact space. Here's an example of a compound gear train, and this is the engine valve train from a Formula One engine. And as we've talked about before with automotive engines, we have the, the crankshaft down here. And if it's a four stroke engine, we need the camshafts up here to be rotating at half the speed of the engine crankshaft. And so if we were to look at uh, the crankshaft or the gear that's attached to the crankshaft and compare that to the, the camshaft size and also look at the compound relationships here, we would discover that there is a, a speed ratio, a speed reduction of one half uh, between the crankshaft and the camshafts. Now, this might look a little unusual to you, especially if you've seen other types of valve trains before. This is a little bit out of the ordinary. Most, uh, well, passenger cars are not going to have this kind of gear train. There may, may be a, a number of reasons why an engineer would decide to use a gear train instead of an alternative like a chain or a belt for an engine like this. Formula One cars, for example, are designed to run at much higher RPMs, and there are a lot of other failure modes that we may need to consider when designing an engine like this. What does a regular valve train look like? Uh, does it include a, a compound series uh, gear set? A more typical gear train looks like this, where we have the crankshaft down here that is driving a timing pulley that drives a timing belt or synchronous belt. And then up here, it drives the two crankshafts. And we have some idler pulleys to keep sufficient tension on the timing belt. 
belts and chains are quieter than gear trains. Uh, if you have ever listened to the sound of a Formula One engine, uh, the, the wind from the gears is, is very significant. Uh, it, these are less expensive options, belts and chains, but they cannot handle the conditions that are experienced in an F1 engine. Here's another simple application of a compound series gear train where we are trying to achieve a really significant speed reduction between this electric motor that has relatively low torque but can run at high speeds. But then in this paper shredder, we have these cutting teeth that need to move at relatively low speeds but have really high torque to cut through many sheets of paper simultaneously. And to achieve that, we have this multi-stage compound series gear train. These are helical gears. And if this is the input over here, we can see right away there's a really big speed reduction between the first and the second gear. And then we have this uh, reduction again in the number of teeth and then another reduction. And you, maybe you can see down below this gear, you can see there's another reduction. Those teeth mesh with this gear. And then this is what finally drives the, the cutting teeth. We're going to go through a few gear train examples worked out by hand. And the first one is a simple series gear train, so not a compound gear train. And then the second one is a compound series gear train. We're going to go through and quantify these, and this will help in learning to analyze these gear trains. Suppose we have a series gear train with four gears in mesh. And on the left hand side, gear one is the input. And we can take output of, uh, from any of the other gears. And here we have the specifications for the pitch diameter for each of these gears. If gear one is the input, we can see if it's rotating clockwise. And if gear four is the output, then it would be rotating counterclockwise. And based on what we've discussed so far, it's really just the ratio between the input and the output gear sizes that dictates the speed ratio. And so D1 equals 10, D4 equals 25. And so I would expect a speed reduction of 2.5. But let's actually go through the calculation using the train value. First, I'm going to define the speed ratio. That's going to be equal to the input speed divided by the output speed. And for a single mesh, that's going to be equal to the output gear divided by the input gear. But it's also equal to that if we have a simple series gear train. Let's look at each of the meshes in turn in sequence and then see how we can combine all of these together and show that it is just simply the ratio between the last gear and the first gear to get the speed ratio. If we're looking at the first mesh, if omega 1 is specified, then we just need the ratio d1 over d2 to determine what omega 2 is. So now omega 2 is known. So what is omega-3? Omega-3 is known. Now let's have a look at what is omega-4, the final gear. That's going to be omega-3 times d3 divided by d4. Now let's make some substitutions and see if we can relate this back to the previous formula. I'm going to substitute omega-3 right here is equal to omega-2 times d2 divided by d3. And then d3 over d4. That comes from right there. And now we do the substitution for omega 2 right there. And we get omega 1 times d1 over d2 times d2 over d3. And then d3 over d4. We can observe a couple of things here. One is this demonstrates where the train value comes from. And if omega-1 is the input and omega-4 is the output, that's going to influence uh, whether this is the train value or if it's the inverse of this, that's the train value. 
but we also can observe that all of these intermediate gear sizes just cancel out. And so we can verify for the simple series gear train, the output is equal to the input times the ratio of the input gear to the output gear. Or in other words, the speed of the last gear is equal to the speed of the first gear times the diameter of the first gear divided by the diameter of the final or the last gear or if we need to put this in terms of number of teeth then we can say that's equal to the speed of the final gear times the ratio of the number of teeth on the final gear to the ratio of the number or to the number of teeth on uh, or sorry first gear and last gear just to keep those straight and remember for gears to be in mesh they must have the same pitch and if they have the same pitch we can show that the ratio of diameters is equal to the ratios of the number of teeth now we're going to move into uh, another example this time a compound series gear train and this one has a more significant speed reduction. This is my attempt at making a rough sketch of this compound series gear train and in this case we will see that the sizes of the intermediate gears do matter. Uh, one thing to note right up front about this compound gear train is here we have gears two and three attached to the same shaft and so therefore we have omega two is equal to omega three and with that if we go through the same process as we did with the last gear train then we'll see that d1 and or sorry d2 and d3 matter in the overall speed ratio calculation whereas if it was a simple series train uh, gear train then that would not be the case so let's step through and use the same process here we have omega 2 is equal to omega 1 times d1 over d2 assuming uh, that omega 1 or gear 1 is the input now let's look at the next mesh the mesh between 2 and 3 well but those are just equal uh, to each other and so we can say those are omega-3 is also equal to omega-1 times d1 over d2. And then finally, we can say omega-4 is equal to omega-3 times d3 over d4, because we're looking at the mesh between gears 3 and 4. And then we can substitute here for the quantities above, and we can see that this is going to be equal to omega-1 times d1 over d2 and then d3 over d4. So in this case, we don't have any further cancellations. Up here, these are all the driving gear sizes. And down here, these are all the driven gear sizes. So you can see we have this product of the driven gear sizes in the denominator and the product of the driving gear sizes in the numerator. And that matches with the uh, product formula that we saw earlier for the, the train value. Uh, in other words, we have omega L, the speed of the last gear being equal to the train value times the speed of the first gear where the train value is equal to the product of the driving gear sizes whether in diameters or in terms of number of teeth divided by the product of the driven gear sizes. Let's move into this next topic of multi degree of freedom gear sets. We've talked previously about what might be called the canonical planetary gear set or sometimes called an epicyclic gear set. And we're also going to talk today in a little bit more depth about differentials. And also just to point out that while there are no really significant homework problems that focus on 
say, complex planetary gear sets. This is a really good topic that could show up as a short answer exam question to help make sure you really understand this concept of multi-degree of freedom gear sets. Let's talk first about planetary gear trains. As I mentioned before, with planetary gear trains, it's possible to achieve very large speed reductions in a compact mechanism. We've talked about these before. We have three main components that can serve as input or output. We have the sun gear, the planet carrier, and the ring gear. Here's an animation that shows a case where we have locked the planet carrier to remove one degree of freedom and if we have the sun gear as input and the ring gear as output this provides a speed reduction with a reversal of direction. Here's another case where we have locked the ring gear and if the sun gear is input this provide and the planet carrier is output then this provides a speed reduction without changing direction. And remember, it's the rotational speed of the planet carrier, not the planet gears themselves, that is the output. And so the rotational speed of this planet carrier is quite a bit lower than the rotational speed of these planet gears. Let's look at this analogy that is kinematically similar and I think helps to understand what's going on with this canonical planetary gear set conceptually uh, much better than just digging right into the, the rotational system. The basic idea is we're going to think about unwrapping the sun and ring gears into flat planes. So this is sort of like converting these over to uh, a rack and pinion gear set where the sun gear and the ring gear both become racks and we have the planet gear serving as the pinion in between. And we've used this analogy previously of a cylinder rolling between two plates. And here we can do the kinematic analysis of this to start to learn how, how do we actually calculate the speed ratios involved with the planetary gear set. So here the left hand plate represents the sun gear, right hand plate represents the ring gear, and the gear in the middle that's meshed with both of these represents the planet gear. And then the vertical motion of the axis of rotation of the gear in the middle, that represents the motion of the planet carrier. One analogy is a rolling pen on a counter, or we used the example previously of, of rolling a pen on a table as well. So this is the kind of kinematic motion and relationships that we're talking about here. So if we have this situation where the table is fixed, it's not moving around, then the left-hand plane corresponds to the fixed table, and this gear in the middle corresponds to the rolling pin, and then the plate on the right corresponds to the moving hands. And then we can identify what directions things are moving and the direction of rotation. So if the right-hand plate is moving downward in the figure, then the rolling pin is going to be moving downward, but at a slower speed, and it's going to be rotating clockwise. How many degrees of freedom does this system have? Let's think back to the section earlier on basic kinematics and mechanisms. We're looking at the number of degrees of freedom a mechanical system has and introducing constraints which remove degrees of freedom. And by going through the same kind of analysis, we, we can look at the number of degrees of freedom. Here, if we're looking at this plate and we're assuming it can just move up and down, then that's one degree of freedom per plate. And then we have two degrees of freedom for this rolling cylinder or the, the pinion gear in between. It can move in this translational way. The axis of rotation can move up and down. And then also we can have rotation. And then we have the other plate. So we have this other translational degree of freedom. So without constraints, before we mesh anything, we have four degrees of freedom. But what happens when we mesh things? 
Remember, the number of degrees of freedom after we add in joints, after we add in these constraints, is going to be the number of degrees of freedom without joints minus the number of degrees of freedom that were constrained by joints. So here when we bring everything into mesh, we have these two rolling contact joints and we're gonna make the assumption that there is no slipping, there's no sliding at these contact surfaces. Each rolling contact joint removes one degree of freedom. So therefore, the total number of degrees of freedom of this kinematic system is four minus two times one, or two. Two degrees of freedom. This is a two degree of freedom kinematic system. There are a few options that we have for using such a system. Um, we could let everything be free, and that means if we have one element that is the output, then the two inputs somehow need to be specified. Either we have uh, a torque input for each of them, or we have a speed input for each of them, and then that's going to uh, dictate what is the output torque or speed. Another option is we could add an additional constraint, and this is what we did with the rolling pin example. If the table is fixed, that removes one of the degrees of freedom, that reduces the total degrees of freedom by one, so we only have one degree of freedom, and then it behaves more like a standard gear set. Let's look at a few different cases where we are constraining this kinematic system in different ways. Case one is where we have two degrees of freedom, uh, where both plates can move vertically, and also the center or the axis of rotation of the, the cylinder is free to move as well. So in motion, it might look something like this, and we can have a non-zero velocity V1, a non-zero velocity V2, omega-2 that's going to be linked, and then uh, this non-zero velocity V3. The arrows point in positive directions. I'm using a sign convention here so that we can work out the kinematic equations. And suppose joint one here is the mesh between the left-hand plate and the pinion gear. And here we can define the constraint due to joint one. So we have the left-hand plate moving at velocity V1. And we have some relative velocity between uh, V1 and V2. And joint one is going to constrain that relative velocity. And so here I write that V2 minus V1, or the relative velocity of two with respect to one, is going to be equal to the rotational speed of the cylinder, omega two, times the radius of the cylinder, R2. J2 is the joint or the constraint corresponding to the mesh between the cylinder and the plate on the right hand side. Here we are looking at the relative velocity of V3 with respect to V2. And because of J2, this is going to be constrained to be uh, equal to omega 2 times R2, or in other words, uh, the tangential velocity of this ro rotating cylinder, uh, but it's in a moving uh, coordinate system. And if we combine these, we can obtain this kinematic relationship, that V2 is equal to one half of the sum of V1 and V3. And another way of thinking about this is this V2, or what corresponds to the planet carrier uh, velocity, that's equal to the average of the plate velocities. And remember these plates correspond to the sun gear and the ring gear. But the, the key result here is that uh, the relationship is this average of velocities. This is what uh, is sometimes called a symmetric differential. And we're going to look at a case where we could have an asymmetric differential. And when I say differential, uh, this refers to a system that has the, the capability of routing 
power uh, and splitting power uh, through multiple outputs or possibly combining power from multiple inputs. So again, uh, we're going to look at another case here, case two. Instead of allowing everything to move, we're going to fix this left-hand plate that is analogous to the sun gear. And because of this uh, additional constraint, we've reduced the degrees of freedom to one degree of freedom. And this corresponds to the, the rotational uh, analogy here where uh, we have grounded or, or fixed the sun gear. Um, we're, we're not allowing the, the sun gear to move. And the two degree of freedom kinematics are, as we derived earlier, V2 equals one half of V1 plus V3. But we need to add in this case two kinematic constraint where V1 is equal to zero. Uh, there's no movement here of the left-hand plate, or in the rotational analog, there's no rotation of the sun gear. And if we plug in V1 equals zero right here, then we simply get V2 equals one half of V3. And if we think back to what's going on with the, the rolling pin analogy, as your hand is moving uh, and rotating the rolling pin, the rolling pin is going to be moving at half the speed that your hand is moving relative to the fixed table. Again, the planet gear axis velocity is the average of the plate velocities. It just so happens in this case that one of the plate velocities is zero. This is a speed reduction if the input is the right-hand plate and the output uh, is the, uh, the, the axis uh, velocity. Let's have a look at this next case, case three, where we ground the right-hand plate, where we have one degree of freedom. And this is analogous to fixing the ring gear. So imagine having a constraint where we uh, attach the ring gear to an inertial reference and we then can have a look at the kinematic equation and, and see what happens when we fix this uh, right-hand gear. And that corresponds to setting V3 equals zero. And so again, we have this uh, result where we, we have the planet gear axis velocity being the average of the plate velocities. These kinematic relationships are pretty straightforward right now when we're looking at the translational analogs where we have V1, V2, and V3 just moving in uh, a, a linear direction. But when we map back to the rotational system, then that's where the size of the gears comes into play. The number of gear teeth will factor in. And we'll see how to do that in just a few moments. In this case, uh, just to be complete, this is also a speed reduction. So let's see what happens if we ground the planet axis. Uh, if we have, again, just one degree of freedom. In this case, this is analogous to fixing the planet carrier. So this red structure that connects the planet gears, that's the planet carrier. And suppose if we hold that fixed, that's not allowed to rotate. In this case, there's no translational motion. The, the pinions, the planet gears, they can still rotate, but the axis that they are rotating on, that can't move. So with this additional kinematic constraint, then uh, we say that V2 is equal to zero. And here, V1 is simply just the negative of V3. So we get a, a direction change but we have no speed reduction or speed increase, at least with this uh, analogous translational system. But we will see when we move to the rotational system that we can have a speed ratio. So in this case, the planet gear axis velocity, again, is the average of the plate velocities.
and the average of the plate velocities is zero in this case. And I should point out here that uh, this is actually case four. We, ha we have four cases that we've gone through, and so this is mislabeled. I hope that doesn't cause too much confusion. Let's go a little bit deeper with this analogy. We're going to continue with the plate and cylinder analogy, but go through force and energy analysis to complement the kinematic analysis that we just went through. In this analysis, we're going to assume steady conditions. In other words, the acceleration of each of these components is zero, and so then we're not going to have any uh, additional forces due to acceleration. We are going to draw a free body diagram for each of the three components in this system, the, the plate and cylinder system, and then we're going to apply the Newton's law and equations of equilibrium and use those to derive an end result. Suppose we're using this sign convention where we assume that we can have some external force that is acting on the left hand plate F1 and then if we have this plate in mesh with the rolling cylinder or the, the analogy to the pinion or planet gear then we're going to have the potential for some force in between the pinion and the, the left hand plate. And here we're going to assume that this force is tangent to the, the pinion and in the same direction as F1. With the equilibrium equations, it should be pretty clear that at least without acceleration, that F1 should be equal to F21, or the, the force on 2 from, or sorry, the force on 1 from the pinion gear 2. Here we need to quantify three different forces. We could have a force acting on the axis of rotation of the cylinder. We could also have a force acting tangentially either on the left-hand side or the right-hand side of the cylinder. Let's apply equilibrium. Now let's see what we can learn from this. Now we can see uh, a path forward where maybe we can resolve all of the forces or derive a, a general set of equations that applies to planetary gear sets based on this plate and cylinder analogy. Before we get to the end, we're going to have a look at the, the, the forces through a, a free body diagram on the right hand plate. Again, we can have an external force, F3, acting on the right-hand plate, and we can also have this internal force, F23, that's acting between the cylinder and the right-hand plate. As with the left-hand plate, F3 must be equal to F2 relative to 3, and then we can start combining these things. And we can see that F1 is going to be equal to minus F2 minus F3. These are all of the external forces that can be acting on or, or from this system. And now we have this relationship, at least under steady conditions, that must be satisfied. This works for this translational system, but we can map this back to the rotational system as well. Another way of writing this is to simply say that the sum of the external forces must be equal to zero. So that's a force analysis. Let's think about the work being done. Let's do an energy analysis. We're using this sign convention where these directions for force and velocity are positive with respect to external interactions. And here we want to look at the work done by external forces, the F1, F2, and F3 quantities. And of course, work is equal to force times velocity, and power is equal to 
force times velocity. And because of conservation of energy, the sum of all of the power elements, all the power terms, must be equal to zero. And so the magnitudes and the signs of F1, V1, and so on, they must add up such that we have zero total uh, change in power. And we can write that here as the sum from I equals 1 to 3 of the product of the force Fi times Vi, and that all must be equal to zero. So the force analysis that we went through first and the energy analysis next, this is helpful in um, deriving from fundamental relationships some of the kinematic relationships that are useful in planetary gear sets. Here's a summary of the main results of the force and energy analysis. Equilibrium must be satisfied, the sum of all the forces must be equal to zero, and the sum of all the, the power components uh, due to conservation of energy, those must also be equal to zero. Let's have a look at an example uh, based on case three where we're wanting in an automotive automatic transmission to produce a reverse gear. We want to reverse the rotational direction of the output velocity with respect to the input rotational velocity. And so here we're going to start off with this plate and cylinder analogy. And if I remember correctly, uh, this was actually case four, uh, uh, where I had two case threes uh, in the, the earlier examples. Here we are saying that the axis of the planet gear, uh, that translational movement is equal to zero. And we're going to have this kinematic constraint that V1 is equal to minus V3. So V2 is the average of the two plate velocities, and the average of the two plate velocities is zero. So here we're achieving this reverse rotational direction using a planetary gear set. And now we're going to map this cylinder and plate model back to a rotational system. Here's an animation showing the case where we have the planet carrier fixed. If, say, we have the sun gear as the input, this orange gear in the middle that's rotating clockwise, and then the ring gear as the output that's rotating counterclockwise. So we have a reversal of direction, and we also, in this case, have a speed reduction. And that was not clear or uh, that's not something that we can show using the plate and cylinder analogy, but once we map back to the rotational system, we can show how it is a speed reduction. So here we're holding the planet carrier fixed, the sun gear is the input, the ring gear is the output. So we're going to go through what are the kinematic relationships in the rotational analog, the rotational version of this kinematic system. And I'm going to switch back to the drawing tablet so that we can go through these kinematic relationships. Suppose we have a standard planetary gear set, and we assume that the planet carrier is locked. In other words, the rotational velocity of the planet carrier, not the planet gears, is equal to zero. And our job here is to find the speed ratio. In this case, the sun gear is the input and the ring gear is the output. Suppose these are the things that we know starting off with. Thinking back to the plate and cylinder analogy, we know that at least in the translational version, V1 is equal to minus V3 and V2 equals zero. And so our job is to map this back to the rotational system. And then also let's assume that we know the pitch radius of the sun gear, the planet gears, and the ring gear. Here's my attempt at a simplified diagram of a planetary gear set where I've only drawn one planet gear, and the planet carrier is this simple 
structural element here that connects the axis of rotation of the sun gear to the axis of rotation of the planet gear. These marks indicate that this is held fixed, it's not moving. So if the sun gear is the input and it's rotating clockwise, then the planet gear is going to, it's meshing with that and it's going to rotate counterclockwise. But this center, this axis of rotation is going to stay put. It's not going to move in an arc at all because the planet gear is fixed. And then uh, because of that, the ring gear is going to be rotating counterclockwise because of that mesh. And our job now is to see how can we map these translational velocities to these rotational velocities. And we're going to need to know not only these initial kinematic relationships, but also the pitch radii of the different gears. Let's have a, a look at the velocities zoomed in on the three different gears. The tangential velocities at the meshes are going to correspond to the translational velocities in the plate and cylinder analogy. Here let's focus in on the sun gear on the left, the planet gear in the middle, and the ring gear, the internal gear on the right. Here we have two different mesh points. Here I'm going to call this V1. That is the velocity of the sun gear at the mesh point in the tangential direction. And then V2, that corresponds to the motion of the planet carrier. And then V3, that corresponds to the tangential velocity of the ring gear at the mesh point between the planet gear and the ring gear. Let's start off with the most obvious relationship. Here, V2 being equal to zero means that the rotational speed of the planet carrier is equal to zero. And again, make a distinction in your mind between the rotational speed of the planet gear and the rotational speed of the planet carrier. The planet gear is going to be rotating, but the planet carrier is not because this point is not moving. The axis of rotation is not moving in an arc as it would be if the planet carrier was not fixed. Let's have a look next at V1. So this is the tangential velocity of the sun gear at the interface between the sun gear and the planet gear. And if we look at this, just by definition of rotational velocity relative to tangential velocity, we can write that this is equal to the rotational velocity of the sun gear times the pitch radius of the sun gear. We can do the same thing for V3. V3 is going to be equal to the tangential velocity at the ring gear at the mesh point, the interface between the planet gear and the ring gear, and that's going to be equal to the ring gear rotational velocity times the ring gear pitch radius. Now if we combine all of this with this earlier known relationship, V1 is equal to minus V3, then we end up with Vts, which is equal to V1, and that's going to be equal to omega srs, and then that's going to be equal to minus V3, but V3 is equal to the tangential velocity of the ring gear, and minus Vtr, that's going to be equal to minus omega r, r sub r. And if we now have this relationship defined, then we can go through and calculate what mg is. Remember from over here, that is equal to omega s over omega r. And so here we have omega s 
here we have omega r, knowing that this term is equal to that term, then we can simply solve for mg, and that's going to be equal to minus the pitch radius of the ring gear over the pitch radius of the sun gear. So that is the answer to the initial question, what is the speed ratio? And here it actually can change. If we have a different ratio between the ring gear size and the sun gear size, then that's going to allow us to change the speed ratio. And if we go back and, and look at these figures, we can see how this might be accomplished. We can change the size of this planet gear, and that's going to allow us uh, to change the size of the sun gear. Say if we have uh, a given size of the ring gear, maybe in one design there's the sun gear, and then here's a planet gear, and it's really large relative to the sun gear. But alternatively, what if we had a really large sun gear and a much smaller planet gear? Then that's going to change this ratio. Uh, in this case, we're going to have a larger sun gear if we have the same size ring gear, and so we're going to have a smaller speed reduction. And then in this case, where we have a small sun gear uh, relative to the ring gear, then that's going to give us a larger speed reduction. For this case, where we have the planet carrier locked, which is the reverse gear. And in this case, this is pretty desirable. This, if we have a uh, reverse gear for an automotive automatic transmission, when we're backing up, we typically do want to have a speed reduction. We're going at slower speeds, and we would like to have sufficient torque to be driving the car at lower speeds. Let's look at a couple of additional things. We can also write that the output speed is equal to, and that is equal to, the sun gear speed times 1 over mg or minus omega s times rs over rr. So that's the, the inverse of the speed ratio. And as usual, we can address this question of whether we have a speed reduction or an overdrive uh, by looking at the magnitude of the speed ratio. So here, the magnitude of the speed ratio, that's going to be equal to the pitch radius of the ring gear divided by the pitch radius of the sun gear. And in this case, at least with this particular configuration of an epicyclic or planetary gear set, this is always going to be greater than 1. If the sun gear fits inside of the ring gear, then there's really no way for us to have uh, an overdrive where we have the magnitude of the speed ratio being less than 1. So this is an overdrive, and this case is a speed reduction. Also, one last note here. If we observe that the number of teeth of each of these gears is proportional to the, the pitch radius, and that the, the pitch of the teeth for any gears that are meshing must be the same, uh, then we can observe that this ratio, RR over RS, that's going to be the same as the number of teeth on the ring gear divided by the number of teeth on the sun gear. We're going to have one final look at this configuration and use a different analysis strategy. And we're going to see that we get the same result for the speed ratio. Let's have a look at the train value. Now, remember, here we're looking at the product, uh, products both of the, the driven and the, the driving gears. We can use this strategy for a, a planetary gear set. And so let's have a look at, well, what are the driving gears and what are the driven gears in this particular configuration? Again, assume that the sun gear is the input. Here I'm going to assume a clockwise rotation for the sun gear, omega s. Here we have counterclockwise rotation for the planet gear, and then also a counterclockwise rotation for the ring or internal gear and the ring gear is going to be the output.
For this, we're going to have the following ratio. The number of sun gear teeth, so that's a driving gear, times the number of planet gear teeth. That's also a driving gear. It's driving the ring gear. And now we need to look at the driven gears. Well, the sun gear is not a driven gear, but the planet gear is both a driving gear and a driven gear. And then the ring gear also is a, a driven gear. And the number of planet gear teeth cancels out. And so then again, we get the ratio of the size of the sun gear to the ring gear as the train value. And now we can go back and write that the speed of the ring gear is equal to the train value times the speed of the input, the sun gear, or that's equal to n sub s over n sub r times omega s. And this agrees with our earlier calculations. This is just an alternative way of arriving at the same result. Let's have a look at the case where there are no elements held fixed. Let's suppose the right-hand plate is the output and a desired output force and velocity is specified. So V3 and F3 are known. We have four unknowns in this case, but we have three constraints. Remember the sum of the forces need to be equal to zero, and then the sum of these power components also need to be equal to zero. And we have this requirement that V2 must be the average of V1 and V3. We have one more degree of freedom, so we need to specify one more quantity. We can really choose an infinite number of options that will produce the desired input. We need to choose one input as a decision variable, and then the other three are determined using these constraints. And one question we could address here is how should the power be split between the two inputs? So if the left-hand plate and the cylinder are two inputs, we have power flowing in from each of those inputs, and the proportion of the power that flows in from each of those inputs, that could be a decision variable. Let's map this back to a purely rotational system, starting with the plate and cylinder analogy, and of course this constraint on V2. This corresponds to uh, one type of mechanism known as a spur gear differential. This is not the typical con configuration of differentials in uh, automotive powertrains right now, but it is a type of differential where we can have uh, a power split. They are kinematically analogous. Here, omega-2 must be equal to one-half of omega-1 plus omega-3. Here we have this planet carrier that is this uh, external structure, and that is what's rotating these two different uh, sets of planet gears. And then we have these sun gears that are connected to the output shaft. So if this was used in a car, these shafts would be going out to the wheels, and then the planet carrier would be the input, and that would be omega-2. And so the speed of the planet carrier, the input, would have to work out to be the average of the output. So if we were to have one of these shafts held fixed, it's not moving, then what does that mean? Well, it means the other shaft is going to be going twice as fast as the input, the rotational speed of the planet carrier. The left-hand sun gear rotation here takes the role of the left-hand plate translation. Of course, we have to use the uh, pitch radii in making the uh, calculations for kinematics in the rotational system. The right-hand sun gear takes the role of the, the plate translation. Um, oh, yeah, those text boxes got mixed up. But so here, yes, this corresponds to the planet carrier. And then the right-hand plate, that corresponds to the right-hand shaft or the, the right-hand sun gear.
Here's an alternative configuration for a differential, and this is what is typically used in an automotive powertrain. Here we have the input shaft being perpendicular to output shaft. So here's the input shaft that's coming from the drive shaft that connects the transmission to the final drive. Here we have a hypoid gear set that we've talked about previously. And this ring gear here, that is connected directly to the planet carrier. And the input shaft is rotating this direction the hypoid gear set changes the axis of rotation. We have an output shaft going to the right wheel, an output shaft going to the left wheel, and let's try and track through what's going on within this differential configuration. So the input shaft pinion drives the ring gear and what's called the housing, which is analogous to the planet carrier. And then here we have two sun gears. The, the sun gears in this configuration are bevel gears that are splined to the output shafts. Uh, so here we have one input and two outputs. And we can have different amounts of power going to the different outputs. These other bevel gears that are meshed with the sun gears, those serve the role as planet gears. This allows the left and right wheels to rotate at different speeds for going around corners. If you imagine a set of concentric circles that are uh, going around a common instant center as a vehicle is going around a curve, then the radii between the two wheels and the common instant center uh, are different. And so therefore, the speeds of the inside wheel versus the outside wheel need to be different. Just a, a note about this interesting difference between symmetric versus asymmetric differentials. We are viewing here what is called a symmetric differential. A symmetric differential has the same speed ratio between the planet gears and the sun gears. So here we have a planet gear and the sun gear, and it has a speed ratio that's the same as the ratio between this planet gear and this sun gear. So that's one possible type of differential. But what happens if the speed ratios were different? Maybe we have some type of power split device where it would be desirable to have different speed ratios. Then we could use an asymmetric differential. So this requires an alternative configuration. We would need to for example, make this sun gear smaller. But to do that, then we'd have to change the axis of rotation of this planet gear, but still keep everything in mesh. We might need to change the size of the planet gears. Uh, in, in any case, uh, it's going to require some significant changes to this configuration to result in uh, a feasible asymmetric differential. It definitely has more complicated kinematics, but it has more flexibility in the possible speed ratios we can achieve in a powertrain. It still has two degrees of freedom, so we could still use it as a, a power split device where either we're combining two different input power sources or producing two different output powers that are, are split in, in different ways. This more general kinematic relationship that accounts for asymmetry can be expressed in this way, where we have this quantity k that quantifies this asymmetry. But a special case is where k equals 1. That is the symmetric differential case. And then we can, if we substitute k equals 1 here, then we get this result. And then it maps directly back to this earlier formula. So just to confirm that this is a more general formula that allows both for symmetric differentials and asymmetric differentials. I want to point you to at least one of several videos that are really helpful for understanding how differentials in automotive systems work. There's this excellent video from 1937. It's a, a classic that I think does an excellent job showing in, in a very nice visualization how these differentials work, how we get these power splits, how we get different speeds, and, and why we need the different speeds as cars go around a corner.
I'm going to move on now to the, the final uh, topic here uh, for this lecture. This involves force analysis of helical gears. In this course, we have focused almost exclusively on spur gears. It's the, the most straightforward type of gear to analyze and design. But in our broader approach to mechanical systems, we are treating things such as thrust forces or axial forces. And how do we resist these forces, say, with thrust bearings? So the next section we're covering is on roller bearings. And so you're going to need to learn how to sufficiently resist thrust forces, axial forces, and shaft systems. And it's important for you to know what some of the sources of these axial forces are. And one of them is use of helical gears. There is another type of axial force source that's going to be important to you in the semester project. When you are designing the shaft for your rear suspension, you need to account for the lateral forces that are generated at the tire contact patch. These are the forces that are perpendicular to the direction of motion, but as you go around a corner, you're going to have some reaction forces pushing on the contact patch that are actually causing the cornering of the vehicle. And these are going to be pushing in the axial direction of the shaft that is supporting the, the wheel and tire assembly. And so in your semester project, you're going to have to design the shaft and bearing assembly such that you can resist forces in this axial direction and meet the requirements. Uh, you don't want your shaft system or your bearings to fail at loads that could be generated by this vehicle system. On to helical gear force analysis. I'm going to go through this relatively quickly. Here is a simple diagram of a helical gear. Here it's drawn as a, a cylinder. It has what's called a pitch cylinder. Uh, not just a pitch circle, and the teeth here are at an angle to the axis of rotation. And that's quantified here using the helix angle psi right there. And so uh, keep in mind there's this angle, and that's going to have a big influence on the directions of forces. And so here we're imagining a contact point right here, and we have this total force, the combined force, acting at some angle at that contact point. And a helpful way of resolving this force is to look at these three components of that force. Here we have the radial component. That component is important for shaft analysis. We, we need to make sure that our shafts are not uh, deflecting excessively due to these radial forces, or we don't have bending stresses that are excessive due to these radial forces. And then here we have the axial force that we were talking about. This is what we need to, uh, we need to address the axial forces in design of the shaft and bearing system that supports this gear so that uh, we have a way of uh, producing the required reaction forces. And then here we have the tangential force. And this is what actually generates torque in the shaft. So th this is an important aspect, an important component of this overall force. And then we have these other angles. This one we're going to focus on uh, this uh, phi sub n. This is the normal pressure angle. And we're going to be using that in our ca calculations here, as opposed to here, the tangential pressure angle. As I mentioned before, helical gears are not a big focus of this course, but they are an important source of shaft thrust forces, and that is something that we are addressing explicitly in this course. A homework problem requires calculation of helical gear thrust forces, and also you're going to uh, need to understand thrust forces for your semester project. W, this is the total force. WR, radial component. WT, tangential component. That is what gives rise to torque. WA, that's the axial component. That's what gives rise to the thrust force. Psi is the helix angle, and phi sub n, it should be sub n, is the normal pressure angle. And I'm just going to go through quickly what the relationships are. Here we have the radial component that's equal to the total force times the sine of the normal pressure angle. Then the tangential component is equal to the total force times the cosine of the normal pressure angle times the cosine of the helix angle. 
and then the axial component is equal to the total force times the cosine of the normal pressure angle times the sine of the helix angle. One of the important things to keep in mind here is as we're designing a gear system, usually uh, with some sort of shaft system, we often will know what is the torque. And so if we know what the torque is, then we can pretty easily calculate, well, what is the tangential component? If we know the torque acting on this shaft, then if we know the pitch radius of this helix gear, then we can calculate what is WT, the tangential component. So often that's the known, and then the radial force is unknown, and the axial force is unknown, and we need to know those. We need to know the radial force for calculating stress and deflection in the shafts, and we also need the axial force in designing uh, mechanisms for resisting these axial forces. We also need to know all of these components as we are going through strength analysis of gear teeth. In this type of analysis, especially if you have uh, more than one set of gears meshing, the, the main challenge really is to be really good with your bookkeeping, uh, making sure you are consistent with coordinates, say signs for forces or rotation, and there's a lot of opportunity there to maybe overlook or, or get something mixed up. Uh, that's one of the main places where I, I see issues in doing helical gear force analysis. That's all I wanted to cover as far as helical gear force analysis. Uh, just enough for you to get through the, the, the problems that are, are relevant here. And with that, I'm going to end this lecture. Thank you very much.